the topic of our talk, top five myths about API security and what to do instead. I'm Rob Dickinson, VP of Engineering at Greylog. Let's jump right into it. We're going to go through five myths. Myth number one, attacks are rare. It's a terrible myth. We would like to think that our attackers are outliers. Back in the old days, if you sampled API traffic by volume, you might see something like this. Most of your users are valid users. You might have a couple bad apples in there. The other way this would manifest would be folks would say something like, we'll worry about getting attacked when we reach some level of popularity. But even then, you're hoping that your attackers are outliers. With modern traffic and modern APIs, the API environments are so hostile that in a lot of cases we see something more like this. The attackers are not just significant, the attackers may actually dominate the traffic by volume. If you're a financial services company, for example, this is probably the world that you live on a daily basis. The reality is a lot of folks are struggling with this idea. Just to give you two real world quotes around this. We met with a major online media company and this was one of the quotes that came out of this, was our firewall blocks roughly half of the traffic, and we know there's still significant attacks getting through. That's huge. That's a huge amount of traffic. This is a very popular online property, so this is literally millions of requests a month that are getting blocked. On the financial services side, here's another quote, CISO for one of the major crypto trading platforms saying that they assume that 80% of traffic will be malicious. Everybody wants what they have. Everybody wants to steal their coin. The other reality of this is that your cloud APIs are really not private. Attackers don't care that your API is only supposed to be used by your mobile app. That's an excuse we hear a lot. Attackers don't care about that. If it's accessible to them, they're going to they're gonna use it. Attackers also don't care that your API is only supposed to be used by a specific partner or for one specific purpose. If that API is accessible, they're going to hammer on it. The other thing that comes into this is that public clouds have known IP address ranges. When you're deploying your application to a public cloud, you're deploying it into an IP address range where it really is discoverable. That's pretty scary. A lot of folks don't acknowledge the risk of this. There's really nothing private about a public cloud, as it turns out. What that translates to is the, really the new reality is that attacks are a constant, everyday part of life. And to validate that idea, obviously we got some great feedback from some specific customers, we got some great feedback from the community, but we wanted to try to quantify this a little bit to have a data-driven approach that would go with this. How we proved this to ourselves is we used some honeypot applications to do this. We took some simple honeypot apps, we deployed those apps to the cloud. Because it's a honeypot app, we didn't have any legit users. We didn't run any ads that pointed to these apps. We didn't have any links that pointed to these apps. We were really anticipating that the only way, the only folks who are going to be able to find these apps were folks that were port scanning or IP scanning through the known IP address ranges for the cloud providers. We used our technology to record those API calls. Again, as assuming that most of those calls are coming from spiders and bots and live attackers because it's not a real app and it's not something that we actually promoted in any way. What we found was maybe not completely surprising, but really good confirmation of all these ideas that we've talked about so far. So having done this multiple times now, having used multiple cloud environments in order to do this, we see on average it only takes about 28 minutes for the first attacker to show up. You deploy an endpoint on the cloud environment, not even an hour later your first attackers are going to be showing up to try to break in. When you look at the volume of that, the volume that we've measured is 154 attacks per day per endpoint. That's over 50,000 attacks per year per endpoint. That's really significant amount of malicious traffic. And again, it just really speaks to how hostile a lot of these, a lot of these API environments are, these public cloud environments are. The other thing that surprised us about this is 
then in a lot of cases, these attack vectors aren't really understood. And that's why I want to jump into just a quick demo here to show you what we learned from one of these honeypots, because we had a case here that really surprised e even us. What I'm showing you here is, this is still says resurface, soon to be rebranded as Graylog API security. This is the technology that we use to record those API calls and to do the analysis, the threat analysis, in terms of what we're, what we're gonna see here. The first couple things that show up on this list of problems and issues that we detected were things that we expected to see. We expected to see leaked runtime errors and malformed bodies because we actually had that as a behavior of the Honeypot application. We wanted to do that on purpose. The restricted file attacks, that's a very classic attack pattern that attackers use, so we weren't surprised to see that at all. Then we saw this. We saw, and the count is a little smaller here, but we saw basically a steady stream of redirect-oriented attacks. That was a total surprise. As it turns out, the framework that we used to build the Honeypot application actually has a default redirect mechanism that's configured on by default. We had no idea that was actually the case. And that's a really good way to, that's a really good mechanism for attackers to use is to redirect through your property. There was no meaningful redirections in our app. So we weren't doing anything like OAuth or anything like that would actually require redirects as part of the processing that we were doing. So again, we thought that we knew this app. We thought we, we designed this little app. We thought we knew everything about what it was gonna do. We got some good confirmation about the kinds of attackers that we showed up. Then this was really a light bulb moment for us that there is this default behavior around redirects. We were completely unaware of it. How did we find it? We found it by monitoring the attack traffic itself. These systems, they're very complex. They have a lot of moving parts, they change very quickly. And so I think this is just a, a pretty fabulous example of how even what seems like it's a very simple case can, can actually be more difficult and have unexpected behaviors compared to what you expected. Now that we've dispelled myth number one, that attacks are rare, let's talk about one of my next favorite myths, uh, this idea that attackers are outsiders. So the myth here, and, and what we hope is going to happen, is that our attackers are outside of our secure perimeter or our safe jurisdiction. That's a very human thing to, to hope for. There's something very human about saying, let's, let's build a wall between us and the people that we don't like. In a lot of early web-based systems, this idea of drawing a very hardened secure perimeter was, was a big part of the security posture. The reality though, when we look at modern systems, is that these threats are everywhere. Even if you think you have some kind of secure perimeter, chances are that perimeter is much more porous than it used to be. One of those cases that you really wanna be aware of is the idea of an authenticated user being an attacker. In a lot of cases where we're thinking about perimeter security, we're thinking about blocking those outsiders. We're blocking the script kiddies. We're blocking the port scanners. We're blocking all the network level attacks. That's all great and that's good and you should do that. But you have to recognize that if a user actually signs up and they're a valid user and they're signing in with valid credentials, they're gonna breeze right through that secure perimeter. They're gonna go right through your firewall. That idea of being, of authenticated users being an attacker is very much an application level attack, but something that has really grown in popularity in the last few years. Some other variations of this, again, that are working within that secure perimeter is two different kinds of insider attacks. But you could have an attack who literally is by an insider, by an employee of the company, by a contractor, by someone else who's affiliated with the company, somebody who has access to, the, access to any of the equipment potentially, any of those people who are insiders, who have any kind of trusted access, 
they can potentially be attackers. Gartner says this is one of the largest growing segments in attack traffic are the insiders. Another variation of that is host takeover. This kind of goes more to the safe jurisdiction side of things. You might say, we don't have any customers in country X, so we'll block all of the traffic from that country. What happens then is the attackers based in that country will just stage their attacks from somewhere else in a different jurisdiction, or ideally launching that attack from within your secure perimeter. These are all ideas where that idea of perimeter security is really not faring as well as it used to be. The other thing that you see in the news quite a lot, and we'll see more moving forward, are supply chain attackers. These are very much insider-oriented attacks. And the important thing to acknowledge here is just that a lot of APIs depend on other APIs, which they depend on other APIs. You tend to have these very long dependency chains. There's also a ton of software components that go into making a, a modern microservice. And all of those components essentially have threat aspects to them that can show up essentially as insider attacks, right? You are running your supply chain inside your secure perimeter, and that's, that supply chain is very long and complicated. These are all things that we have to acknowledge that these threats can come from anywhere. It, it's not just going to be arising from overseas attackers that we can easily block just based on their country of origin. The other thing about thinking about perimeter security is you have to acknowledge that there are some really significant trade-offs at the perimeter. I'm not anti-WAF, I'm certainly not anti-perimeter security. Everybody needs a firewall, everybody needs a WAF. You get the best WAF that you can, but there are trade-offs involved in that. And everybody who's running a WAF today is gonna to recognize these trade-offs. As you ask the WAF to be more aggressive, in terms of what the WAF is blocking, the performance impact of the WAF is gonna go up. It's gonna add latency to those transactions the more that you ask that WAF to do. And that's important, right? There's a direct correlation between the performance of transactions and the value of that service. This isn't just inconvenienced by being a little bit slower. You cross a certain threshold in performance and people just nope out. The other thing that comes out, out of this as you ask the WAF to be more aggressive is typically your number of false positives is gonna increase. This is something that a lot of organizations have a very low tolerance for dealing with, with false positives. The risk of losing revenue due to a legitimate transaction being blocked is a, a risk that a lot of organizations struggle with. This is just the reality. So as you ask the WAF to be more aggressive, it's gonna slow down and the chances of false positives is typically gonna go up. The other aspect to this is that your perimeter itself is also not a static concept. Your WAFs have to be managed properly, they have to be operating properly, they have to be configured properly. Obviously, if they're not, <laughs> then obviously folks are gonna breeze right through that perimeter. Detecting whether or not the firewall is working as intended or giving feedback about how the firewall could be working better goes a long way to helping deal with some of these trade-offs. The other aspect that comes out of this, which is a trade-off that we hear all the time, is that a lot of the WAFs that are out there today are fairly generic in nature. They do a really good job at blocking the most highly anticipated attacks. But what they don't do very well is they're not particularly easy to tune for specific applications. You might say, I know the level of protection that I'm gonna get out of the box with my WAF, but how do I harden that WAF better against my specific users, for my specific applications, for the kinds of threats and the kinds of risk that I'm most focused on trying to mitigate, these WAFs turn out to be very hard to tune. And closing the loop here, a WAF that's improperly tuned 
may also have performance problems, may also have issues with false positives. So this ends up being, there's a whole life cycle here around firewall management that really starts to chip away at that idea that you can just put in the right WAF and it'll keep out all the bad people. You won't really have to do anything um, other than that. A WAF is just another component in your stack that you have to manage and you have to know that it's working properly. The other reality that's really specific to APIs is that APIs are increasingly built and designed around this idea that they want to be shared. Firms that are participating in the API economy have better earnings. The number that Gartner cites is that firms that have public APIs, that provide APIs, their revenue is 12% higher than their competitors who aren't. So th this really is material for the health of the business. But the only way that you recognize that value is if your APIs are composable. This idea came out of Amazon originally. I don't think they invented it, but they certainly made it a lot more popular. This idea that in general, you, sh you should feel pressure for your internal services to become external. So basically trying to make everything into an external service. As you cross that threshold and all of your services are essentially consumable as external services, that allows outside vendors, suppliers, customers, partners, whoever, to compose those into new systems. Maybe not the systems that you would have built, maybe purpose-built for their domains or with their use cases in mind. But this is really the driving force behind API development and the rise in popularity in APIs. And I think this directly challenges this notion of perimeter security. How do you really enforce perimeter security when your APIs are supposed to be open and available to everyone? There is a good answer for this, which is really the zero trust model, right? Zero trust is all about not relying on a specific secure perimeter, but really building those checks and those authentications into all of your systems, regardless of whether they're internal or external or geared to, sp to specific clients or specific partners or whatever the case may be. So the zero trust model really goes a long way to helping that. And then what I want to show with our second demo here is the alternative to perimeter security, which is really the idea of asynchronous detection and alerting, which is what we're really focusing on with Greylog. In this case, what we're doing here is we're recording, just as I showed with the honeypot example before, we are recording all of those, all those requests. So these are the requests and responses that come through the firewall. And so there's a couple things that we can do with this right off the bat. The first thing is that we can give feedback about how well the firewall is actually working. Because what we're grabbing here are the actual requests and responses that hit those API endpoints. So that's the first thing that we can do, is we can start to look for cases where the firewall wasn't configured properly, where there might be routes that aren't going through the firewall. Maybe there's internal users that are calling those properties where it's not going through a firewall, not going through the gateway as it's expected. So we can provide a sanity check against what those firewalls are doing and identify the cases where they can be improved. And so a lot of the things that we end up flagging in our analysis are things where you would hope this, and this is a classic example, a restricted file attack is a fairly generic, you know, IP scanning, port scanning kind of attack. You really would hope that your WAF is going to block those cases 100% of the time. But what if it doesn't? <laughs> Do you have a way of detecting that? If the firewall's misconfigured, or again, if there's alternate routes that aren't going through the firewall, if you aren't aware of that, you can't possibly respond to that. That's one of the, one of the best use cases here. We, we don't want to replace your firewall, and we certainly don't want to advocate not having a firewall, but 
you have to make sure that the firewalls are working properly from the perspective of the application. The other thing that we do in our system is we're focused on asynchronous detection and alerting. So this really goes to breaking up that trade-off, some of those hard trade-offs that we talked about before, about we can ask the firewall to do more, but it's going to slow down, the risk of false positives goes up, and etc. What we're doing here is we have a, a large catalog of out-of-the-box signatures. These are all quality issues, security issues, threat-related issues that we're able to detect in the traffic. And most importantly, we're doing this in a completely asynchronous way. We can add as many signatures as we want to without slowing down the original transactions. That's really exciting. Now you have a new balance point to think about. What are the active real-time protections that you want to put in your firewall? And then what are the asynchronous detections that you want to put through your monitoring system? And now you have a better way to balance what you're doing with your firewall versus your asynchronous alerting. The last point here is that with our system, it's also extremely easy to create your own signatures. This is where it gets into that point I made before about that WAFs can be difficult to configure for specific applications or difficult to customize for specific applications. In our system, all of the data that we have here is available for not just for searching, but also for asynchronous analysis. So we can take any search result and turn it into a custom signature in just a few clicks. This doesn't require any coding, doesn't require engaging with Graylog as a vendor to provide that new signature for you. It's very easy to go in and create your own signatures a low effort way now to start building some very API specific or domain specific protections into your monitoring stack. And again, everything that we're talking about here is all asynchronous. So you're, you've really broken out of that trade-off between if my WAF is the only thing that I have, then I have that horrible trade-off of I can ask it to be more aggressive, but I know that comes with consequences. Myth number three, one of my personal favorites. <laughs> this mistake is so easy to make. The myth that IP addresses equate to users. Such a persistent myth, not just among technology people, but among legislators and other folks that are, are trying to figure out uh, some, some of these issues. Now, I know that's a bit of a provocative statement to, to make, so let me walk that back just a little bit. I'm not saying that IP blocking has no merit. I'm not saying that IP addresses aren't useful. Of course, IP blocking is extremely effective against certain kinds of attacks. If we're talking about system level attacks, network level attacks, IP blocking is a very classic and good technique for dealing with those kinds of issues. IP blocking is also the best way to enforce allowed jurisdictions. It's really the, the easiest way to get your hands around that. There's a lot of good things that come with using IP addresses and implementing blocking policies based on those IPs. As we start talking about APIs more specifically, we have to acknowledge that IP blocking is not terribly effective against application level attacks. That's just the reality of the situation. Another way of putting that is that detecting those user tokens is a lot more difficult than detecting the IP address, right? The IP address is available at the network level. That's something that's intrinsic to those network transactions. It's relatively easy to get the client IP address out of that. To try to get the user token, though, which would be the user name or the API token, the thing that you logged in with, that's not your IP address. That's your user token. That's typically uh, an application level concept. There isn't just something at the protocol level at the network that says user token equals. It's usually not that clear. 
It may live, that user token may live in the header, it may live in the path, it may live as part of the request body. In terms of where that data is located, it can be in, in multiple different places. That's part of the reason why IP addresses are easier to work with. They're easy to get. It's the data that's easy to get. But getting to that user token is much, much harder. So again, we're not advocating against <laughs> IP address processing or IP address blocking. We do a lot of that in Graylog at the IP address level. We have to acknowledge that's not as effective as you go higher and higher in the application stack. The reality is that user accounts are actually users. IP addresses are not users. And let me unpack that statement a little bit, just in case there's anybody who hasn't heard this before. But some of this is just core TCP IP, how the internet actually works. When we're talking about an IP address is only an identifier on, a, on its local network, right? And another way of saying that is that the internet is not a network. The internet is a network of networks. And that's really the concept that you have to get your head around to understand the difference between an IP address and a user account. Some specific examples of what we mean by a network of networks that means that a single IP address may represent multiple users at once. You might have multiple users who are flowing through a gateway. That gateway is essentially assigning one client IP to all the traffic that's being uh, multiplexed through that gateway. And you see this all the time. So anybody who's accessing the internet through a corporate gateway, for example, will show up essentially as the same IP address. And that's a necessary and very helpful thing to do in terms of planning your network and how your network works. You cannot count on an IP address to identify one particular device or one particular user. As convenient as that might be for setting certain kinds of policies, it's just something you have to watch, right? Because IP addresses are not exactly the same thing as users. The other variation on this, so a single IP address can be used by multiple people at once. It also goes in the opposite direction. A single person or single individual can use multiple IP addresses over time. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we see this all the time, right? Anything that's managed through DHCP, you go to your coffee shop, you connect to the network, you're not being assigned a, a network address that no one else has ever used before that's going to uniquely identify you. You're going to get the IP address that someone else was using earlier in the day because they're being rotated through all the time. So again, these aren't things that are easily changeable. These concepts that we're talking about here are really baked into TCP IP and how the internet works at a fundamental level. We just have to be careful about equating users and IP addresses. We just, we can't conflate those at a really fine grain. And part of the proof for that, if you think about this, so if you're still struggling with this idea that, and it's fine if you are, <laughs> if you're struggling still with the idea that maybe IP addresses are individual users in certain cases or whatever, the, the last data point that I'll leave you with here is think about when you log into Gmail, think about when you log into Google, think about when you log into Facebook, whatever it is, what is it that you're logging in with? You're not logging in with your IP address. You're logging in with a username. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because of all these things that we just covered, because you really cannot count on an IP address to be a durable identifying token that identifies one particular account. Um, again, still has lots of merits, safe jurisdictions, dealing with network level attacks, things like DDoS attacks, all those things where it really makes sense to trace back to an IP range. Do that all day and feel good about it. But just be careful if you're going to cross the threshold and think about an IP address as an individual user because they really aren't, and that model's going to break down very quickly. All right. Myth number four. Authentication and TLS is all you need to do. <laughs> one of my favorite, another one of my favorite myths. 
The reality is authentication and encryption are necessary, but they're not necessarily sufficient. Authentication and TLS mechanisms can break. And when we look at the numbers on this, authentication failures are at the heart of many of the breaches that we see reported in the news all the time. Part of that is that authentication is something that typically applies system-wide. So as an attacker, if you can crack the authentication system or if you can find something there that isn't configured or not working properly, that's typically going to give you very broad access across the system. This is a really great entry point for attackers. They know that hopefully everything is authenticated. And so if you can crack the authentication system, you can typically get a lot of, of data out of the system. The other reality here is looking at this kind of from the development side, a lot of folks will say, might say something like, yeah, but we only want our systems to run with TLS. We only want our systems to run with encryption. That's a lot more difficult in reality than it sounds to say it out loud. The reality is that all of these microservices are developed and tested without encryption, typically. If you're a developer and you're running software on your laptop as you're developing, if you're working in uh, certain kinds of QA environments, it's very commonplace not to go through the extra steps of deploying TLS in all those cases. TLS takes extra work, and that extra work comes at a cost. When you look at the tech stacks that are actually running these APIs, almost all of them that I've seen operate in HTTP mode by default. And even when you turn on TLS, they still have the ability to downgrade and run without TLS. They're developed and tested that way. So it's extremely difficult to ensure that your microservices are only running in TLS mode in production. And it's really easy to have a configuration or an environment-specific issue where the, the TLS layer is not working as expected and this, the microservices are, are, are happy running without that TLS layer of protection. It, it's an easy mistake to make. The other kind of configuration issue that we can get into here is configuration issues around the authentication layer or even at the gateway level. So the Optus attack hack in Australia, for example, is a good example of this. That was a, a data leak based on the fact that the API endpoint in question didn't have authentication on it. It wasn't deployed properly. It wasn't behind the gateway the way that it was designed to be behind the gateway. So the microservice was developed, assuming that the authentication is being provided by the gateway, but then the microservice gets deployed in the wrong way, and it's not sitting behind a gateway, which means it's just happy running without any authentication at all. These configuration issues, they're difficult to detect in production. They're easy to make, and they're also easy to break because we're changing these systems all the time. We're rolling out new features. We're rolling out new services. We're hardening things. We're making things better. Anytime we change the configuration or the working state of the system, we have the potential to break some of the security protections that we hope are going to be there all the time. Now, you could look at this list and you could say, yes, that's all valid. But that is all things that the API provider has control over. So, you know, this is somewhat, this list here is somewhat at your level of sophistication. But I, I would argue that every organization, large or small, is going to deal with these issues at one point or another. There's another side to this coin, which is even if your authentication is working perfectly, and even if your TLS and your other means of encryption are working perfectly, you are still at risk to authenticated attackers. What we mean by authenticated attackers is an attacker who signs up as a customer. One of the worst cases of this 
is an attacker actually puts down their credit card or whatever method of payment, and they sign up as a paying customer. This is just the scene in the bank heist movie where the first thing that the bank robbers do is they go to the bank and they open a safety deposit box so that they can get a glimpse of what the vault actually looks like, right? This idea that you can come in and you can sign up as, a, as an attack, you can sign up as a customer and gain access that way, this is really hard to, to prevent against, right? Most organizations want to get more customers. Now, you could say, hang on, we have strong know-your-customer requirements, or we have other things that we, we are sure, we're assured somehow that those attackers are not just showing up as valid users. And obviously, a lot of financial institutions have know-your-customer requirements. Does that make them immune to attack? Absolutely not. The reality is any valid account can be used as an attack service from this perspective. That also doesn't necessarily mean that the account holder is in on the attack, right? I may sign up as a customer at the bank, and an attacker may take over my valid account without my knowledge and use that as a way to stage an attack against the bank. This is also something that's very difficult to protect against, and you have to have a specific security program that's going to identify these kinds of attacks. Everything that we talked about here around authenticated attackers, this is going to go right through the firewall. This is going to go right through the API gateway. It looks like it's being done on behalf of a real customer. And this means that we have to be able to tell the attackers from the valid users based on what their actual activity is. Not just their jurisdiction, not just whether they have valid credentials or not, you also have to be auditing the actual activity of those users. All right, our last and final myth, one that's very close to my heart as a software developer. This is something that we hear about all the time. One of the biggest problems in security is this idea that developers don't care about security. If I had a nickel for every CISO that I've heard say some variation of this, I'd be a very rich person. This is really more of a cultural item than the things that we looked at before, which were much more technical in nature. I think this really is something that's holding back our industry in terms of how we think about security and especially application level security. My position here is I think developers really do care about security. So I bristle a little bit at that idea that nobody cares on that side of the house. A good developer will always try to balance correctness, performance, security, complexity, and cost. That's what you do as a developer. You're constantly trying to optimize for the, all those things and keep all those things in balance. That's what's going to make you a, a good developer and a, and a more successful developer over time. So security is, is not the only consideration, but it is a consideration that's in there. Here's where it starts to get more difficult for the developers. The developers and the DevOps staff, they typically don't have access to those production environments. As a developer, how do I care about security when I can't really see the impact of security in the production environment? What I'm going to see as a developer is I'm going to see the system running on my laptop. I'm going to see the system running in a sterile staging environment. I love it when folks say, again, not to throw stones at our friends in security, but I love it when I hear folks say things like, if the system was designed to be secure from the outset, then we wouldn't be having all these problems in production. It's very difficult to design for requirements that you can't really see with your own eyes and you can't really test. And by the same token, it's bad security policy just to make all your production systems available to whoever wants to get in and see them, right? We're, we're not advocating for that. It's very difficult to react to things that we can't see. It's very difficult to design then protections around these things that, that we can't really understand. The other part here that you have to acknowledge is that developers don't own the roadmap in a lot of cases. So most organizations, product changes, 
have to be approved by product management. They have to be scheduled. They have to be put into a release. It's not just going to the developer and waving your hands and say, you have to care about security more. We have to fit our security concerns in balance around all these other things. There's always lots of different things competing for developers' attention. If you want your developers to care more about security, you have to acknowledge this. You have to open up ways of sharing that data, sharing that attack data, sharing those production incidents that can flow back through the, the development cycle. You need your product management team on board. When your developers are working on security, they're not going to be working on other things. And you need product management to embrace security as one of the features and capabilities that you're improving over time. So not just hand-waving here, but really putting your developers in a place where they can make the right choices. Keep correctness, performance, security, complexity, and cost all in balance. That makes developers like me really happy when you have the information to do that. The other reality here is that it's not just development, it's also QA. QA really cares too, and we should acknowledge that. So good QA teams, they try to anticipate and validate all the possible inputs, all the possible states of the system. The QA team never has access to production. They only work with sterile staging environments. How is QA supposed to know that they're adequately testing threat vectors that are going to be expected in production? They typically can't. They try to do their best. But just like we said before, without having direct exposure to what those security issues look like, it's very difficult to make those kinds of threats part of your test plan. The other thing to acknowledge here when we're asking development and QA to care more about security, we also have to acknowledge that any change that the developers make have to be tested. And the tests that are involved in that have to be updated. They have to be written if none exist. They have to be updated with all the new capabilities as the security posture gets stronger. Not everyone in security knows what the development cycle looks like or what the test cycle looks like. Most environments, you can't just have a firefighting exercise with development and say, we've got this thing we need to fix and that you're going to have the fix the next day. As we said, you have to have product management involved, but you absolutely have to have QA involved. Nothing's going to get released until the QA team says it's okay to release that. That's something that has to be acknowledged here as part of the, as part of the landscape. The other reality here is that a lot of the incomplete tests... Just as we said before, because QA doesn't have access to these environments directly, they can't see these behaviors directly, they're trying to be imaginative, you can't release something without having adequate tests in place. There's really material work here that comes into, you identified a new issue, it's probably a new issue because it fell through all of your other existing test plans. So you're going to have to improve those test plans and your test cycles are going to get longer as you're testing for more and more of those security issues. I would challenge anybody on the security side, if you're, feeling, if you're feeling friction between your organization and the development organization, most of us are, that's totally natural. But the thing to do is to realize that it's not just an enthusiasm gap here that you have to cross. We really have to work to get requirements and understanding over to the development team and the QA team so that they can better predict and anticipate what needs to be done. And by all means, if you do that within the existing development and QA process, you'll make everyone involved in that process happier. That's a huge part of this. All right, to recap here with a few last recommendations just to sum this up. Like G.I. Joe always said back in the day, knowing is half the battle. Now and knows knowing is half the battle. Here's the things to keep in mind all on one slide. For modern APIs and modern cloud-based systems, you really should be assuming constant attacks. Don't wait. <laughs> There's, as we showed before, those attackers are going to show up right away. The, attack, the attacks will last as long as that property is reachable. So you want to prepare for this. You want to practice for those attacks. 
that, that's going to be the normal status quo, is being under attack. So you want to get more and more comfortable with that. In terms of our thinking, we want to shift our thinking from thinking about secure perimeters and hiding behind those secure perimeters to really embracing zero trust techniques. That's a very powerful mental model to, to apply to your secure design. And, and I think the folks who've already made that shift to more of a zero trust mindset are having a much better time in, in their security posture. I hope I made the case here that IP addresses are not users. You always catch yourself, <laughs> or you should always double check your thinking when it comes to this. Is it really a policy that you can attach to an IP address, knowing that those IP addresses are multiplexed? Or is it a policy that really needs to be tied to the user account based on the token they provide or the name that they log in with? Those are separate concepts from the application point of view, so don't conflate those. Also, don't assume that authentication, TLS, and other security features are always configured and working properly. You have to have checks and balances here. You have to have a way of auditing that the authentication is right, auditing that you're not sending secure information over non-secure protocols. That has to be an active part of your security posture. It's not just good enough after a breach to say, yeah, things weren't supposed to work that way. That's not a valid defense. You have to have telemetry and have processes that assure that these security features are working the way that you hope that they are. Then the last one is you've got to have good baton passing between security and your development and QA groups. And you'll get a lot of love from the organization if you can crack this. As we are able to share more information share more of that context. We're able to have more empathy on both sides of that. We're able to mesh up the security practices with the development QA practices. That's something that if we can turn that from more of an adversarial relationship into more of a cooperative relationship, that's something that is going to show up in terms of all kinds of benefits. So thank you for attending this session. I know we covered a lot of ground. Thank you. <laughs>